Hello, my name is Jana Ellis and I would like to read to you an excerpt from my sample translation of the devastated by Tildora Dimova. Dimova is an award-winning Bulgarian author and playwright and her work has already been translated into nine languages, sadly not yet available in English. The Devastated was published in 2019 and in 2020 it won the Novel of the Year Award of the 13th Century's Bulgarian National Endowment Fund. The book has already been translated into French and in May 22 Dimova became the first winner of the Fragonard Prize for Foreign Literature published in France. The Devastated tells the story of three women, Raina, Ekaterina and Victoria and a child. Victoria's daughter Magdalena, who lived through the 1944 invasion of Bulgaria by Soviet troops, the establishment of the new communist regime and the purge that followed. Also through the story of Alexandra, we learn of the devastating consequences these events had on future generations. Wives of intellectuals, priests and entrepreneurs, Raina, Ekaterina and Victoria don't inhabit the same social circles when their world collapses in early 1945 with the murder of their husbands. Ekaterina, the more modest of the three women, teaches literature, while Raina and Victoria seem to be the embodiment of the ease and sophistication of the interwar period. Yet they, as the wives of their husbands, find themselves included into the elastic category of enemies of the people. On the surface, it is because they represent the economic or religious oppressors. Behind the collective accusation, however, we also discover over the course of the story the tipping point for each of these women. The moment when the much more personal and arbitrary motives of the new men in power surface when they condemn their former neighbours to death or forced rural or exile. The construction of the story is simple in appearance, uh, however nevertheless full of asymmetries that make the, ba the bonds between these women stronger, even if apart from their family units they don't meet each other. Dimova's writing is fluid and very visual, and I do hope I have been able to transfer this into the English. Her subtle and direct style, as well as the sobriety of her prose, makes this book an evocation imbued with humanity. It is very difficult to read this book at this moment without being irresistibly reminded of the current events in the Ukraine and the fates that many innocent women and children are likely to be suffering at this time. The extract I would like to read is from the start of the book, Raina's story. Raina. The coldest month, the darkest night, the iciest wind. Raina back and forth like a bat between rooms, bumping into walls as if she can't see them. Wandering through the apartment in the February night, withered, darkened, drained, a shadow of the woman she was only a few months ago, can't stop fidgeting, comes close to an object and withdraws as if it burns her, opens the window and listens to the silence of the icy night. The cold rushes in, she wraps herself even tighter in the dark blue Angora scarf steps backwards, closes the window and continues her absurd walk from one room to the other, now to the lounge, now to the office, to the bedroom, walks past the children's bedroom and listens, until she hears Sia and Tildor's peaceful breathing, and then back to the window, and opens it again and freezes in expectation, trying to catch any sound. Yes, Petko had promised her that the moment he heard anything, he would either send her note or drop by or at least find a way to give her signal but there was no news from him and that was putting her nerves on edge. And then once again back to the kitchen, but what is she to do there? Her long woolen skirt gets tangled around the legs of the chairs. Straighten the tablecloth, move the small vase, adjust the little icon of the Madonna and child on the wall. Check on the jam jars with white cherries, so calmingly lined up next to each other. On top of each jar sits a white piece of paper, tied in a bow with a string, looks like a little dress. And again close the pantry, tiptoe across the hallway, stepping only on the white tiles, not the black ones. And then back again into the lounge, pause at each window, put more coal in the enamel stove. There isn't much coal left and she needs to be careful. She doesn't know where to buy it. From the storehouses at the end of town, someone told her, but which storehouses? How is she going to find them? That's a man's job. Nicola used to sort out the coal. Nicola used to sort out the children's fee for the German school. The maids pay, Kula who was now sleeping on the couch in the kitchen. Could she really sleep on a night like this? Was Kula even able to understand what was happening or did her simple village girl's mind prevent her from grasping the reality? And she didn't fully believe it. He'll come back, Kakuraino, he'll come back. She kept repeating like an incantation the night they took Nicola away. It was the middle of October 
and since then everything had turned into a nightmare from which Reiner only awoke to descend into an even more sinister dream. Reiner was of an average height, regal, elegant of stature with olive skin and light brown hair. Chestnut brown, slightly mocking eyes, which always lit up as soon as she started talking to someone. She radiated an internal lightness and a natural contentment with life, with the air, with all other beings around her. In her presence, even the smallest and presumably most insignificant day-to-day -day things became illuminated and charming. It's beyond me how you could turn the fish you bought and roasted into such a seductive adventure, Nicola would exclaim enthusiastically and eagerly fuss around her in trembling anticipation of the forthcoming dinner. Because everything had to be in its right place, well presented, beautiful, and only then was it allowed to sit at the table and address the food. In front of you, I somehow feel insignificant, insignificant Rainichke, Nicola would sometimes share, lost in his thoughts, and she would smile and run her fingers through his hair. Despite the fact that I'm brighter and better educated than you, he would smile in turn and take her exquisite hand. Intelligent and clever, but in fact, plain and predictable. Whether I pull this knowledge or that out of my hat like a magician, it doesn't really matter. And the way you buy and roast the fish is vital and meaningful, and all my knowledge doesn't count for anything compared to your fish, Rainichke, my little doe. Nicola would whisper tenderly, and Rainer's eyes would start shimmering with gold. Until recently, she was like a magician and a concubine all in one. A creature from another world who had been dropped amongst humans against its will, wrapped in the mantle, in the mantle of something otherworldly and unfathomable to others. Between her and them, there was always a distance, an invisible void that tempted them to cross it. She would attract men and women alike who dreamt of becoming her confidants and friends, just so they could unravel her mystery. Thank you.